In today's news, airports and seaports reopen post Onesto. Public reconnection ongoing following Ernesto. Efforts to clean up after Ernesto are on the way. Hurricane season through the young eyes. We take a look and a look at rising star footballer Robert Green. West Nile virus is detected in Guadeloupe and who declares monkeypox a global health emergency. We have the details of this and so much more when 284 News returns. this year's Atlantic hurricane season. Meteorologists say that surface temperatures Everyone, may be a control. Everyone, get our own. It's important we stay informed about the storm approaching. You're right. Late August to early September is when the hurricane season is most active. I know when the storm is coming. We can monitor regional conditions using our smartphones or going online. You know, that's right. And we should always rely on sources like the Department of Disaster Management and the National Hurricane Center for accurate information. Right. Those are the organizations that have experts to provide real-time data and forecasts. I hear you. But what if the power goes out? I just downloaded the new DDM app. It will send us updates and alerts. Excellent. Remember staying informed is our first line of defense. Let's make sure we're ready for anything. Stay informed, stay connected, and stay prepared. Because when you're armed with information, you can weather any storm that comes your way. A message from the Department of Disaster Management and 284 Media. There are many ways to enjoy life, like so many ways to count on Popular. Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of 284 News. It is Thursday, August 15th, 2024. I'm Ron Grant bringing you the very latest out of Tortola in the Virgin Islands. A happy Thursday's wish to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Beginning our newscast, the British Virgin Islands have resumed normal operations across all airports and seaports as of today, Thursday, August 15th, following the passage of Hurricane Ernesto. The reopening marks a return to normalcy or some level of normalcy after the storm prompted closures across the territory. The Terence B. Letsom International Airport was the first to reopen, resuming operations on Wednesday, August 15th at 4.45 p.m. The Virgin Gorda International Airport and the August George International Airport on Anagata followed suit, reopening at 8 a.m. this morning. Kurt Manal, Managing Director of the BVI Airports Authority, commended the decision to reopen the territory's airports, stating that the move comes after the issuing of an all-clear by authorities. Comprehensive assessments of the airports ensured that conditions were safe for resuming operations. In a parallel development, the BVI Ports Authority announced in a media bulletin that all seaports have been reopened that will operate during their regular hours from toward today sorry, onward. Now, this includes major facilities such as the Rotown Jetty, Ferry terminals at West End, Joss Van Dyke, Virgin Gorda, and Anagata. The reopening of these critical transportation hubs is a positive step toward restoring normalcy and normal activities in the territory after the disruptions caused by Hurricane Ernesto. Residents and visitors are now able to travel freely as the Virgin Islands returns to business as usual, despite many of the boating schedules being delayed. Recovery efforts continue to follow Tropical Storm Ernesto and his destructive passage with significant progress made in restoring electricity to affected areas. The BVI Electricity Corporation reported Thursday that power has been restored to several key areas across Tortola and Virgin Gorda. These include Pockwood Pond to McNamara, Lower State, Humptons Gut, Horsepat, the entirety of Rotown, Rotown to Kingston, Long Swamp to Beef Island, 
Long Swamp to Greenland, Pockwood Pond to West End, and Seacouse Bay, Virgin Gorder, has also seen power restoration. This progress comes after Ernesto battered the territory for over 12 hours starting Tuesday evening, causing widespread damage and power outages. Now, the storm's unexpected intensity caught many residents off guard, leaving falling trees, damaged infrastructure, and flooded areas in its wake. Emergency response teams have been working diligently since Wednesday morning to clear debris, roads, and assess the full scope of the damage. Despite the challenges, the rapid restoration of electricity to major areas signals a positive step in the territory's recovery. Authorities continue to urge caution as cleanup efforts proceed, warning of potential hazards such as loose debris. While significant progress has been made, work continues to fully restore services and repair damages across the Virgin Islands. Efforts to engage in cleanup activities throughout the territory following the passage of Tropical Storm Ernesto has begun. Throughout the territory, various district representatives and residents, along with public works personnel, are doing their best to get the territory back to some level of normalcy. We spoke to various district representatives to see what works are being done within the various districts. The Honorable Kai Reimer, Minister for Communications and Works, first addressed the impact overall on the territory and efforts moving forward. Thank you for this opportunity and we thank God. Uh, we went through the tropical storm Ernesto. Uh, many would argue that this was more than a tropical storm based on the winds and the, the force of the winds, but again, we thank God. I mean, we did our, <clears throat> our preparation in terms of some gut clearing, some gut clearing uh, before the storm came in. Obviously, we had floodings after the, the storm came in. We had some down trees, down power lines, down poles, um, but the utility teams, um, BVIEC, they've been out uh, working, trying to restore power, um, as well as the water and sewage crew. And, you know, based on the public works crew, we're out early trying to clear the roadway so that it can be, the roads can be passable. We also engaged all the district representatives so that they would also have, um, be able to engage teams to do cleanups within their district. Um, those would include the secondary and tertiary roads so that persons would be able to get out from their homes as well. So we, the works continue, um, we're in the post cleanup mode, and you know we'll hope to restore everything within the territory in the next coming days. The Honorable Marlon A. Penn, District 8 representative, addressed issues faced by residents post Ernesto. We're currently um, cleaning up a lot of the downed trees that has fallen throughout the district on the main road and the bypass roads. And we have some landslides, which we also have crews out currently working to get those cleaned up. Additionally, we have some down electricity poles, and some down lines. There are some pockets of areas where power has been restored and some areas are still left to be restored. Uh, we are working with the Electricity Corporation to get those areas addressed as soon as possible for the residents who have been out of power now some over 24 hours, just trying to get those areas restored. Uh, for the most part, we have had in, um, no no persons have had any any major damages, um, but we're still working to ensure a comfortable ride this morning <clears throat> for persons who are traversing to work. Representative for the Ninth District, the Honorable Vincent O. Wheatley, addressed the situation on the sister islands of Anagata and Virgin Gorder. Particularly of concern to him is the water plant. Over in Anagata, there wasn't any severe flooding issues like it's the norm. But there was a lot of high winds, so sort of quite a few trees have fallen, at least one or two have fallen in the road. There were some wires down. I think the gate at the primary school and the garage school got severely damaged. Other than that, what has happened of concern to me now is there's a problem at the water plant. So as we speak, I'm trying to arrange a technician to be taken over to Enegada to rectify the, the issues at the, at the water plant so residents can have water. Power has been restored, but the plant has electrical issues. So we worked on that as we speak. Other than that, Enegada seemed to have fared quite well. Over on Virgin Gorda, it was a different story. We had a lot of wind and rain, not a lot of structural damage to roofs and so forth. But a lot of trees actually got damaged with um, branches and up in the road. But I think all the roads have been cleared by now. Most persons have power restored, except I think in the North Sound area. 
in a few sporadic areas in the valley. But for the most part, power has been restored to most of the most of Virgin Gorda. Um, there was minimal flooding. The guys were proactive in terms of cleaning the drains and so forth. So there wasn't any any major, major flooding in terms of in the valley. Viewers up next, we have much more on the local scene. We'll be right back after a quick commercial break. Well, am I covered? Yeah, you're with CG. Remember when I was dabbling in knife throwing bingo? Well, one night I won, but I also got a bullseye. No, 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 no. In a beehive. I ran for hours. They caught me in the end, though. Anyway, I was covered, and I got to keep my trophy. Uh-oh. Best medical cover for the price. CG Insurance. Good like that. At Partners for Kids, your child's health and happiness are at the heart of everything we do. We've been the trusted medical home for children and adolescents up to 18 years old. And now, we are excited to welcome a new member to our family of healthcare professionals. Introducing Dr. Aisha Maxwell, our new family practitioner. Dr. Maxwell brings a wealth of experience and deep passion for pediatric and adult care, ready to join our team in providing first-rate health services to your family. At Partners for Kids, we believe in a collaborative approach to healthcare. With partners in occupational therapy and clinical psychology, Partners for Kids, where caring is just the beginning. Visit us at Road Reef Plaza Tortola, open Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Call us at 284-444-5437 or reach out at info at partnersforkids.com to learn more. My name is Judy, VI Motors Operations Assistant, and I'm here with Zing, our mechanic here, and we're going to show you today how you can locate your VIN number on a vehicle. Your vehicle's VIN, or vehicle identification number, it's a unique code specific to your car. It's important for various purposes like registration, insurance, and maintenance. To find your VIN, start by looking at the dashboard on the driver's side. You can see it through the windshield near the bottom corner of the dashboard. It's usually a small metal plate or a sticker with a combination of 17 characters. If you can't find it there, other common locations include the driver's side door jab, engine block, or it may be mentioned in your registration documents. And that's how you find your vehicle's VIN number. Remember, this unique identifier is crucial for various services related to your car. It's a good idea to note it down or take a picture for future references. If you are having trouble locating it, please don't hesitate to ask a professional or refer to your owner's manual for guidance. Thank you for watching this quick guide on flying in your vehicle's VIN. Stay tuned for more helpful tips to keep your car in top condition. Visit us at Dove's Bottom or at our parts point location in Virgin Gorda or call us at 494-2496 or our website at www.vimotos.com. Welcome back everyone and thank you so much for sticking with us. Moving right along, as the Atlantic hurricane season intensifies, young residents of the British Virgin Islands recently had a chance to reflect on past storms and share their anxieties about future threats. In a recent interview conducted by student reporter Ricardo Palmer, two local youth summer, Dunkley and Jeron Daniel, discussed their experiences and perspectives on hurricane preparedness. Now both interviews expressed anxiety about the uncertainty of the hurricane season. They said, and I quote, you really don't know what to expect, noting how quickly storms can intensify. How does un uncertainty of the hurricane season impact your emotion? Mm, good question. Um, I feel like it does express, it, it makes me express a lot of anxiety about it because you really don't know what to expect like you could it could be a category two one day and then a category four the next so yeah it does make me a little anxious i feel uncertainty like like a very same thing as she said anxiety because you don't know when a hurricane will just come it could be same thing as irma maria come again um yeah and in the night, you know how the wind just blowing very hard. You don't know us. Um, 
you know, I, I, I can relate with that too. The youths emphasize the importance of practical preparations, including stocking up on food, water batteries, and portable chargers. They also called for more community support and government outreach to help young people feel safe during the hurricane threats. What steps do you take to prepare for a hurricane? Food. Yeah, food, yeah. <laughs> food storage, yeah. making sure you have like extra batteries for everything like flashlights, making sure you're stocking up on water. Make sure you got a portable charger. Portable stuff. chargers, <laughs> generator. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. In what ways do you think that the community can be a better support with the hurricane season and to help youths to know that they will be safe? Um, I say like more uh, who are on the head, like the, gov like the governors and stuff or whoever else, just come around to the youths, to the churches, make sure they ensure youths, make sure talk to us. Like when you're having youths and stuff, just come along. That's nice, yeah. Um, I think just maybe creating like training program to prepare us and not just prepare us like Oh, these physical things, like like we said before, stocking up on water, stocking up on food, um, but also just being able to prepare the young people like mentally, because it is very mentally taxing going through a hurricane. Recounting their experiences during the hurricanes of Irma in 2017, the interviewees described it, and I quote, as one of the scariest experiences they've ever had. One recalled having to explain the situation to a younger sibling at just 12 years old. It was definitely one of the most scariest experiences I've ever had. Um, yeah, it was it was definitely very, very scary. Um, in the moment, it was a lot of running on adrenaline. So, like, you know how after her game, you have aftershocks. That was kind of like how I felt. Like it was like my feelings didn't come until after the hurricane. Like it was like more just like a go 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 type of vibe. Um, yeah, but until it after, I really was able to just be like, wow, like I can't believe that happened. Mm -hmm. I remember that day. I was just in my room and just boom, hurricane hair. Like oh, all right. And you got to, you know, them stories about people going in their bathroom for safety. That was very real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the winds were hot. And then, then you had Maria coming right after all of us. So it was like, yeah. all that stuck up on you. Yeah, and that came in the night too. Yeah. So it was just, it was really bad. Like, I remember like my, like my little brother, he was like three at the time. And it's just really hard to have to be how old was I, 13, 12, 12, I was 12, like to be 12 years old and having to explain to a three-year-old like what's going on, it was just, it was just too much. Yeah, it would be like crazy to be explaining it because it's like not even something that a 12-year-old can cope because it can even traumatize because myself, I was kind of traumatized. I didn't sleep for three days and Hurricane Maria came, so I was like, up staring at the window, wanted to have to run, you know. Yeah. This can be very traumatizing. Despite the challenges, the youths emphasize resilience and the importance of family time coping with hurricane aftermath. They also highlighted valuable lessons learned, including always having backup plans and the need to stay mentally prepared. The full interview will be released on all Tweet4 Media platforms this Saturday. Local Virgin Islands rising star Robert Green has been making his mark as one of the territory's leading footballers. Representing the BVI as part of the BVI national team, Green has embarked on a career in sports, on and off the field. In a recent interview, an episode of The Art of a Distinguished Gentleman, he spoke about his early introduction to football and sports, which has led him to where he is today. Athletics was always around in my family. You know, my, my cousins, um, you know, Deanna Watley, yes, Brittany Wise, so... It's basically my blood. Um, at the age of three, I got into football mm. and my dad just took me around to the local camps and stuff. Um, and ever since then, you know, football stuck. But during that time as well, I also played uh, basketball, softball, did a little bit of track, but football just 
stuck with me. Green spoke about his choice to study sports on and off the field, specifically the science behind sports. So right now, I'm working on my second degree, uh, second bachelor's degree in sports management at okay. Towson University. Um, yeah, I just figured I needed a change to go more like corporate side of sports and I just chose that route. Before I was in the science route, studying sports performance analysis and science. And yeah, I just wanted to get more into the corporate side of stuff. So that made me choose sport management. He spoke about what preparations look like for him before getting on the field. The process is really like, is, is full of ups and downs, I must say. Um, but you know, when it comes to like game days and stuff like that, like when I'm playing for the BVI, cause that's one of the most biggest um, occasions okay. for, for an athlete playing for your country. Uh, I tend to just, you know, 24 to probably 72 hours before, it really starts to sit in that like the occasion is coming, like it's time to like give mm -hmm. you all and stuff like that. So normally it's just making sure there's no stress in my body, nothing in my mind. It's just clear thing about the game. Mm -hmm. I tend to cut communication off 24 okay. hours. So the only people that can actually reach me is like my family. So my mom, my dad, um, and close friends I'd say, but even they know it's like, okay, nah, Robbie's yeah, like yeah, in yeah. game mode. So, um, but yeah, the, for communication wise, that's my preparations. Body wise, I tend to just relax, um, go over game plans, situations that we've been through, situations that are gonna come, cause we do a lot of studying on the okay. the other team. Um, so it's just, yeah, just, that's basically it. When it comes to community support, Green spoke about what athletes like him need most for their from their country. I think the number one thing we just ask for is just support. I think the feeling that you get when your mm -hmm. whole country is behind you is just electric and it just makes you like want to give more even if you have nothing left in your tank. So like say it's like 90th minute and there's like 10 minutes add on to the game. Like after all the running for 90 minutes, like your body wants to shut down, but the fact like the support from the crowd mm -hmm. and everything, like it just gives you more energy, you know? So like I, for me personally, it's just support, just hearing the crowd, just push you on, push you on and just like scare the, the opponents. Gotcha. You know, so I, I would say that definitely. On the matter of mental health of athletes and having to be able to manage the effects of an injury on athletes, Green shared his very own personal experiences. I've actually been through a lot when it comes like sports wise with mental health because okay. there was a season um, back in 2019, I'd say, uh, I was playing semi professional in, in England and had a great first season. Second season came around, I was ready. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't even have a break in the summer. Off season, I was training, it wasn't even off. So, um, did all that, put myself in a position where I was like highly, um, looked upon to to start and stuff like that and then there also other clubs came to watch me as well and next thing you know i end up having a serious injury in a warm-up mm -hmm. broke my foot my fifth metatarsal and so i was out for six months i tried rushing back because like well these clubs are like looking at mm -hmm. me like this probably my only shot at really going up a next level rush back broke again wow so i had to sit out for another six months and then i broke it again so i broke it three times in total and the third time it was like okay mm. let's just take a longer break um get my mind right get my body right let it heal properly and stuff like that viewers up next we have much more on the local scene we'll be right back after a quick commercial break across the BVI. The fastest, most reliable, and affordable fiber internet service is here for you. Look out for fire in these new locations. Slaney, Duff Bottom, Manual Reef, Seacouse Bay, Albion, Hannah's, Palestina, Pleasant Valley, and Havers. Fiber is in your area. Call 444-4444 or visit a CCT store to find out more and bring it home. More locations coming soon. At Higher BVI, we're not just about business. 
We're about empowering lives, and that is because we aspire to inspire. By choosing us, you're supporting a company that believes in equal opportunities, diversity, and community growth. Our mission goes beyond profit. It's about providing HR solutions, fostering talent, and leaving a positive impact. Join us in building a better future, a better BVI. Choose Hire BVI, where your support isn't just a transaction, it's a transformation. Together, we're changing lives in these beautiful Virgin Islands. Welcome back everyone and thank you so much for sticking with us. Moving right along on the regional scene, the Regional Health Agency of Guadalupe reported the first human case of West Nile virus infection on the island on Tuesday. A man contracted the virus through a mosquito bite during his stay in Guadalupe, according to an ARS statement. He is currently hospitalized. West Nile virus considered the second most widespread flavorous of after dengue was first detected in Guadalupe and horses in 2002. Since then, authorities have implemented epidemiological surveillance, including animal, human, and epidemiological components. On June 28, the virus was found in two horses on the island. While 80% of West Nile infections are asymptomatic, 20% present a flu-like symptom. In rare cases, primarily among vulnerable individuals, severe neurological infections can occur. Now, the virus primarily spreads through infected mosquitoes, but can also be transmitted via blood transfusions and organ transplants. Of course, birds are typically carrying the virus as well, which is then locally transmitted to mosquitoes. Horses and humans cannot transmit the virus to mosquitoes. Health authorities are implementing special precautions, they say, for organ and blood donations due to potential risk for transplant recipients and transfusion of patients. The World Health Organization on Wednesday declared the upsurge of monkeypox in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and several other African countries a public health emergency of international concern. WHO Director General Tedros made the declaration following advice from an emergency committee of independent experts. The decision marks the second time in two years that monkeypox has been designated a global health emergency. The emergency of the new monkeypox strain, CLAD 1B, which appears to spread primarily through sexual networks, has raised particular concern. Committee Chair Professor Dimi Ogona said, and I quote, The current upsurge of monkeypox in parts of Africa, along with the spread of a newly sexual transmittable strain of the monkeypox virus, is an emergency, not only for Africa, but the entire globe. Monkeypox originating in Africa was neglected there and later caused a global outbreak in 2022. It is time to act decisively to prevent history from repeating itself, he said. Over 100 confirmed cases of the strain have been reported in Burdi, Kenya, Rwanda, and Uganda in the past months. In the DRC, more than 15,600 monkeypox cases and some 537 deaths have been reported so far this year alone, surpassing last year's total, who is working with countries and vaccine manufacturers to accelerate access to monkeypox vaccines in the lower economic countries and organizations, of course, have so far released a $1.45 million from its emergency fund and estimates an immediate funding in need of $15 million for response activities. The previous monkeypox emergency declared in July of 2022 due to a multi-country outbreak was lifted in May of 2023, following a decline in global cases. Viewers, that is it for today's news roundup. Be sure to follow us for your daily news updates at 284 Media and, of course, on our WhatsApp channel, as well as to like us on Facebook at 284 Media and 284 BVI on Instagram and X, formerly Twitter. I'm Ron Grant. Do have a safe and enjoyable evening. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Rashford made it. Manchester United have come from behind to lead. At home or on the go, watch CCT Live. Download our app and carry your favorite TV shows, news, or live sports anywhere you go. Visit cctbvi.com forward slash live, select your package, and tune in.